inspiring and power into our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name, O Lord our God, our rock and our redeemer. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, thanks again uh, for having me back here. It really is a pleasure to be back. Um, I just really appreciated the time that Corey spent with me and working with me and helping me. And uh, I just love what this community is and represents not just Caledonia, but to the larger church. So uh, it's really it's a pleasure being here. Like I said, my name's Mitch. Finally here of uh, seminary here. It's been a long road, about six-ish years now. I kind of went slow in the beginning. Um, I have a wife of 13 years back there and the daughter Kaylee, who's 11, and my son Aiden, who's 10, rocking his Michigan shirt, as he should. And, uh, um, you know, I, it's funny, this conversation that regularly plays out with my wife and I, um, and, and to preface this a little bit, I'm, I'm going to be looking at what does it mean to live a focused life? What does it mean to do that in the midst of the busyness of our culture? And so a regular conversation that regular plays out in our household is uh, one of us is really stressed and one of us is anxious about being super busy. And I reflect back to a deep desire in me and said, Mackenzie, we need to move to Alaska. And, uh, you know, just get a cow and, and uh, I could build a cabin and, and just live it simply. Live with simplicity. And uh, she says, well, have fun. Um, you know, there's something in me that really desires that focus. It's not necessarily an easy life to do something like that, but the focus and the simplicity of that. But always where my, my heart steers back, not just because she would leave me, but because also uh, there's something in that was, that's an innately selfish. It's me just wanting to live my life and do my thing and kind of avoid everything else. And that's not what God's Word calls us into, right? He calls us really to engage this world. that's all about. And so we're going to look at this a little bit uh, from that perspective of what do we do with all of this busyness? Because I have a feeling that despite my season right now in school and getting ready for comps and looking to the future and all that, I'm not the only one who's busy. In fact, if you ask somebody from another culture when you're learning languages uh, and you, the, one of the first things you learn is, hello, how are you? And then they teach you generally, I am good. Because this is our culturally conditioned way of responding to anybody, despite how we actually feel. Um, That's true of America as well. But one thing that's become more acceptable in America is when they ask, how are you? You say, I'm busy, right? And this is okay. This is one thing we can say. But it's also kind of a badge of honor in our culture. You know, like, oh, I'm busy, so I'm doing my thing. I'm working hard. I'm getting this figured out. And part of that is this culture that we're always uh, wanting more, doing more, more success, more money, more houses, more whatever, just more. And we can translate that right into our faith as well and think we need to do more, 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 more church volunteering, more this, more that. And that is unhealthy. And uh, repeatedly in Scripture, God calls us away from that kind of a life and calls us into the focus and the simplicity of the gospel. And so we're going to look at Hebrews 12, because that's one passage that I repeatedly go back to in these moments where I'm super stressed out, and I need some encouragement and some reminders about what this life is to look like. So we, we start here, verses, uh, chapter 12, verse 1, and he, the writer says this, says, Therefore, Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, and you have completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son. It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. 
that is such a refreshing and encouraging scripture for me. Uh, And there's a lot there, but what I want you to really get from this right now in the context of this focus and this busyness is that he's calling us to a focused life. And ultimately, he's calling us to a focused life and he's giving us some real practical ways to do that. And that's what I kind of want to address with you all this morning. And I want to address it to you, but I also want to address it to myself because when I'm in this, in the, in kind of up to my neck in life, this is what I need and I need reminders of what this actually looks like. So we look at this first verse and it says, therefore, since we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, and you may look at that and say, who are they talking about? Why is that there? And that therefore is always a trigger to look up in the Bible passage. Therefore means whatever he said before. And so we look at that, and they're talking about these kind of legends of the faith. And this is really helpful because it frames this next thing where it says putting off hindrances, putting off sin. And it frames it together in a helpful way, I think, for a few reasons. One is just the solidarity that comes with being a part of a collection of God followers. It says to you when you're in the midst of your your chaos or your struggles— that says, you know what, you're not alone. And people have done this before you. And people have came out the other side of it. But it also, I love this because it, look at the people they're using. You got guys like Moses and David and Samson. These are not perfect guys. And actually they made some, they made some pretty major mistakes in their lives. And so for me, that's refreshing because it says, despite the weight, the chaos, the sin, all that in our life, that through God, that he's going to deliver us through it just like he did these people before, some named and some unnamed. And he goes right into says, let us throw off those things. Let us throw off those weights. It actually translates. Let us throw away those sins. And I want to talk about the weights. If we contrast it to sin, sin, we kind of universally, if you've grown up in the church, even North American culture, we recognize sin is bad. There's never a verse in here that talks about sin being good. So we're just going to kind of take that as an, as an underlying assumption. If you want a doctrine of sin, Corey's here for you. He's the grad, so he'll give it to you. But sin is bad, and then we see this other side of it, this everything that hinders, and it actually this weight. And what is that weight if it's not sin? That means it may not necessarily be something bad. It might be something actually good. It might be something neutral that we put on in our lives. And we're not exactly sure what that was for them. Uh, We've got some clues from this. That's not what we're going to talk about. But what I want you to understand is it doesn't take us much of a step in our own minds to figure out what are those good or neutral things we put on ourselves in our life that end up just weighing us down and slowing us down in this life. I think about it this way. I love the outdoors, hence my Alaska uh, reference there. Uh, One of the things I like doing outdoors is backpacking. I really like it a lot. And... um, there's two kinds of people in the backpacking world. There's the minimalists, and there's everybody else. The minimalists pride themselves in, in taking the least amount of gear possible to be light, efficient, and go, you know, bust down that trail as fast as they can. And actually, if you do some of these big trails like Appalachian or Pacific, counterintuitively, you think the more the better. Actually, the people who finish those trails are generally the ones who pack the lightest. Um, I am not in that camp as much as I'd like to be. I not only pack for every scenario, I pay, take like shorts and three pairs of long underwear, but I also pack for my friends who I'm pretty sure forgot things too. And so when I should be packing about 40 pounds, I usually have like 55 pounds, which is terrible enough because you're carrying the weight. But then it's really terrible when you're like two days in and your friends are yelling at you because you've taken way too many breaks and you're slowing them down. And this is what I think about these weights that hinder in our own life, is that there are things we pack in our backpack that we think, this is a really good thing to have because what if? And in our lives, we have all of these what ifs. What if this happens? What if this happens? What if I lose my job? What if my kids don't get a scholarship to college? What if? And we play all these out and we start adding all these little things to life that are good, that are beneficial, and that will probably help us in the future, probably. Probably. And we start putting those together to a point that every day of our lives is characterized by busyness. And we've lost focus on what we're actually trying to accomplish. We, we have a general sense of where we're going, but not really. Now we've become a slave to all the things we do. 
And you might, a good test of this is to ask yourself, when's the last time I've sat down and had a real dinner and actually had conversation at home? Or when's the last time I actually had a quiet weekend where I didn't have to do anything? I didn't have to. Maybe you choose to, but I didn't have to. And if those are hard questions to answer, it probably is because you're like me and most of the people in this culture that just keep adding things in because it's going to be better. But the reality is if we want to finish this race well and finish it with focus and with quickness and with efficiency, we have to lighten up. We have to dump our backpacks and get them really light, become a minimalist. And honestly, you talk to, like, I know because I'm not that, but my friends who do this well, they like backpacking a lot more than me because it's a lot easier. And they actually get to cover more miles and see more life and see more territory. And that's what this call is to. But there's also this next category of sin. Sin, excuse me. Hit puberty yesterday, apparently. Um, <laughs> There's this call to, uh, uh, to, to throw away sin. And again, taking this, yeah, universally we say sin is bad, so we're not going to spend a lot of time. But what I want to draw out is that it's also, uh, it's also commanded that we get rid of it. I think one of the lies that we believe today in an individualized culture is that something to this effect, maybe you've heard it, maybe you've said it, is this is the way God created me, so this is the way I'm going to be. And if you're talking about being an image bearer of Jesus Christ, I'll say, I agree with you. If you're talking about being created the way you are with all your imperfections because of the fall, I say, no, you're not. You're more than that. And I want you to live out a life throwing out all that imperfection that the fall has created. And this is what he's calling us to. Jesus lived a sinless life. This is our example. And that's what the later part of that passage gets to is Jesus as the example. And so if we're to throw away sin in our life, how do we actually do that? Well, the great news is on this side of the resurrection is that we actually have, well, two things going for us in a big way. One is that while the curse of that sin might affect us right now, it will not affect us in eternity. That Christ has paid for those sins and given us the freedom. He's literally put his righteousness on us and allowed us to live eternally next to him with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And this is great news because when we're struggling and we're frustrated with ourselves because we just can't figure out how to shake the sin, and I'm serious about this because there's probably people in this room, I know all of us are sinners, so that's not a question, but there's probably people in this room who've struggled with a sin their entire life and can't figure out how to get rid of it. And so the good news is for you is that despite that, that Jesus will, he will not only receive you, he'll invite you in to eternity with him. So that's great news. The second piece of great news is that after the Pentecost, we all have the Holy Spirit. If you call yourself a follower of Christ, you're given the Holy Spirit to empower you to this life. These Old Testament legends that were talked about, the Spirit would come and go. They didn't have the Holy Spirit all the time. They didn't have that powerful, that same Spirit says that brought Jesus from the ground. We have that. So we have the power for transformation every day in our lives. This is great news, but the curse still is with us today, and that's why he's calling us to shake that out so we can live out this fullness of life that he created us for, that comes with joy, that comes with peace, that comes with mercy and uh, even just uh, uh, kindness. Have you ever been so busy you feel like you can't really talk or focus on anybody else, you can't be nice to anybody else because you're just in over your head? These are the types of things that you're freed of when you're in Christ. So he calls us to put aside sin and weights. And then this next passage, we see that he's talking about fixing your eyes on Jesus. Focus on Jesus first. Because, you know, ultimately, when you get in this mess, when you're struggling in the the chaos of whatever you're in, whether it's sin or busyness, We don't see what's right in front of us, whether it's the people we really need to care about or whether it's Jesus himself. We don't see him. And it's calling us first to fix our eyes on him. Actually, that word means to take your eyes off something else and put it on something else. So we're to take our eyes off what I just said, the weights and the sin of the world, and put it on Jesus. And then it goes into this, this, what did Jesus do? And he's saying, ultimately, live like that. He's calling us to 
be like Jesus. Be like Jesus in being, but be like Jesus in doing. Because there's, there's character qualities and there's action. There's tasks that Jesus did in here. And he wants us to live like that, not just, again, for the fullness of life for ourselves, but for the fullness of life of others. He wants us to be the testimony to other people so that they see the life that Jesus has given us and say, I want that. And ultimately, when we're doing that, people just start coming in. And that's what I love about the vision of these house groups here, is they're purposely meant to be out there, out in the community. But they don't do any good out in the community unless you look a lot like Jesus and people actually want in. Because unfortunately, the problem with the church has been is they're out in the community, but they don't look like anything a lot of people really want to be with. They may look like hypocrites. They might look judgmental. They might look all these other things. There's no love. There's self-focus. And all these things that hinder us in our mission, becoming more like Jesus and being, becoming more like Jesus and doing. So as I think about that, what does it look like? Okay, so if we put aside sin and we put aside these weights, these things that come over us, that's one step to living this focused life. And the second step is to literally put on Jesus, put on Christ. Then what do we need to do next? I mean, that should be enough in theory. That should be enough. And I hope it would be. But the problem is, is that we're still human, and we're still broken, and we're still sinful. And so it becomes these seasons where you get really excited about what Jesus is doing in our lives, and that lasts for who knows how long, a month or two, and then we revert right back to the place we were before. And if you don't believe me, just think about your your last New Year's resolution and how long did that last you. Maybe if you're cynical like me, you just stop making them because you know it's not going to last anyways. But I think we we have this pattern as well in Jesus is that we, we take off those things that hold us back, we put on the things that make us more like Jesus, And then we depend on our own strength and our own will and our own power to continue that happen. But what he's calling to is to embrace the Spirit, embrace embrace the Lord's intervention, and allow us to get in this pattern of training. And that's what you see from basically four on, is he's talking about discipline. And when we think about discipline, if you're like me, and if you grew up in kind of a conservative rural family. You have like visions of your father and being really scared of discipline. And uh, you know, when you got in trouble at school, knowing you're going to pay for that ultimately when you got home. And I, that's my view of discipline. When I read these words of discipline and I see God acting like that, it's not that I would uh, not, not, actually I appreciate my, far- my parents' structure, but that's often our frame of reference when we think about discipline. And that doesn't feel very good, even though maybe we know it's pretty good. What's interesting about this word is that it's actually more related to like a competitive environment. He's carrying on this metaphor about the race. And he's tying it in saying almost in this way of of what it looks like to be training. And the Lord is your coach. And when I think about that, it helps me a lot more because when when I think about the old way, what I used to think about it is very punitive. I did bad, I pay for it. This is like the law life, right? And then the other side of it is, is what Jesus is saying is, you're, I know you're going to screw up, but let me help you get past that. And like a great coach, like a great uh, trainer, uh, they work through you. And I, I don't know if any of you have done it, but I've been in sports, so I understand what a coach does. I have good ones and I've had bad ones. I've, uh, I've done some things with training, like physical training, working out, and I've had trainers. And uh, most of the time, when they're pushing you to uh, get better, to condition your body or your mind, honestly, do you feel really good about them at that time? No. You, you actually want to punch them in the face most of the time. And so it's much like this where you... They're, they're trying to make you into the person they know you can be. And that's exactly what Jesus is meant to do in our lives. He's trying to make us into the person he created us to be fully human in every sense of the word. 
And so when we're, when we're looking at this and realize this is not about discipline in a punitive way, but discipline in a productive way, then all of a sudden, it's actually an encouragement. And this is why he says, have you forgot about what I said about discipline? And he gives this great example of this. And so for us, we need to be able to look at that and realize that Jesus is coming alongside of us. It, we, you know, if we're putting off those sin and weights and we're putting on Christ, we, he's coming alongside us to help train us for this event, this race, so we can finish well. And part of a good finish is knowing where the finish line is. It's awfully hard to run a race if you don't know where you're going. And so Jesus, the coach, comes in and helps align our mission and aligns our character into him and says, go, and I'm going to push you in uncomfortable ways. And those uncomfortable ways mean some of those things we've already talked about, stripping some of the bad, adding some of the good. Because let me tell you, both of them get uncomfortable. And so you may have had experiences like that where you're trying to let go of sin or you're trying to put on some Christ-conforming act, like when you're out and about and you see a person maybe drunk and homeless and you just want to judge them like crazy. And Christ says something different. And he says, no, 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 no. This is going to be uncomfortable, but this is what I want you to do here. And so this is where we have to get comfortable with getting uncomfortable and all of a sudden push through all of this other stuff, and get in a training regiment where it's going to stick, where it's not like another New Year's resolution. It's not like my last effort to try to do P90X where it lasted a month and I gave up after like three misses. So I'm like, I'm done. I'm good. Uh, I don't want that. And actually, Jesus, as our coach, comes through and says, I, I know you're going to mess up, but you need to get up the next day and try all over again and keep building those habits, those training habits that discipline in our lives. And the great news is, is that Jesus loves us through it. This is not like us reverting back to Old Testament uh, Israel, where this is all about salvation. This is not about salvation. This is about us living lives that are flourishing, that are fulfilling, that are characterized by peace and joy and love and all these other great virtues that he led the way in. And in the midst of that, knowing our broken and perfect selves are going to fail, but he's going to lift us up like the great coach he is, give us that good butt smack a coach does, and say, get back at it, right? This is what he's called us to do. So I want to encourage you as you're thinking about it, what would that actually look like for me? What would it look like if I could snap my fingers and tomorrow... All of a sudden, I was less like the things I don't want to be. Remember, Paul talks about this, if you've read those sections, or more like the things I want to be. What things would go and what things would be added? And some of these things have probably been ideas percolating in your mind for weeks or months or years. You just haven't done it. You haven't put in that training regiment yet. What would that look like and how could that be? And I'm not asking you to actually just go and add a bunch of things to your life. That would be the opposite. I'm not asking you to become a monk or a nun, and do this over-spiritualized sense of your life. I'm asking you to actually do the hard work of discerning what has God called me to do uniquely to live like a disciple of Christ, and how can me being focused do that the best? Because it's going to be different for each one of you. One of the things that I like to think of, it's not simple addition here. Last week, you guys talked about inviting people into your lives. So you might think, okay, I need to cut out some of these extra things so I can invite people into your lives. That would be great, and if you do that, awesome. That's part of the mission here. But it's not always that simple. Instead of thinking of simple addition, think of addition by integration. Start thinking about what would it look like I have to eat, well, you don't have to, but typically we eat three meals a day, right? What would it look like to integrate better with that time? You're at lunch and you have a lunch hour. You say, well, I should just invite this person to have lunch with me and not be a loner. Or maybe it's not that. Maybe that's one day. It's, I really want to have good time with God and have some devotional time in my life, but I, don't, I can't possibly get up earlier, and I'm a wreck at night. If you have a lunch hour, that would be a great opportunity to do something like that. It's thinking through what would it look like to add by integration. If you're already spending a lot of time with kids at sports, that's a great time to get to know the parents and just be in community. So thinking more creatively about what, did, what does this life look like. So to bring this all together, we have to put off sin and heaviness, put on Christ, and train hard. What does that look like for you? And again, I said it's a lot of discernment. 
And so I have an assignment for you this week, uh, or in the upcoming weeks, I'll give you that. And what I want you to do is think of a time or times that you can spend some time really focusing on this. And so that could be getting away for a night or a weekend. It could be, if you already have a devotional time, spending the next week in that. It could be with your house groups, actually making, committing a, a separate gathering, just that you do this together. But I want you to do three things, and I, I, I say it this way, not to be hokey, but just so hopefully you remember it. Uh, three Ps. I want you to pray, I want you to plan, and I want you to practice. And when you get away at this time or times when you're gathering and meeting or spending time alone, I want you to think about, uh, I want you to pray about what would this actually look like? What areas of my life do I need to put aside? What does needs to get out of my life in order that more of my life will reflect properly who Jesus is? And then when you get rid of those things, what would it look like to live more like Jesus in your own specific context, in your own specific call? And in the midst of that, you're going to probably have some confession. You're probably going to have some, uh, some things that you need to cut, which leads to hard conversations. So, you probably want to pray for wisdom as well. And most of all, you're going to want to pray for the Holy Spirit to empower you to live out these changes every day and in the grace that he offers us. But then you need to plan. And this is the part that's like maybe overly practical, but I really want you to understand that until you, you could have visions of what it could be, but until you actually get a plan together, it's never going to happen. And so one thing that my wife and I have done, and this is my confession, we haven't done it recently, so here I am, uh, is we'd get away for a night or sometimes a weekend if it's been a while and pray and prioritize our life and say, what has Jesus called us to? How are we to actually live and not align our values with what culture says, but what the Bible says? And then how would our lives look or should look to reflect that? And so we'll prioritize everything. We take a blank calendar and then we just start adding things in. And you get to a point where you're probably like, if the list is this long, you're probably only about right here. And all of a sudden your calendar's full because this is how we live. We're not very focused. And your temptation to say, well, I can't get rid of that. I can't get rid of that. I can't get rid of that. It's to challenge you to say, yes, get rid of those things and actually challenge yourself to have margin in your life to live more peacefully, uh, more anxiety-free, more joy, more love. And then finally, it's just the practice of this. Knowing that you're going to fail. Knowing that, quite frankly, you're going to have a hard time keeping this going. And so you're going to have to have that persistence that comes with it. But you're probably going to have to have some friends that push you. And not just to do it, but also friends that lift you up when you mess up, when you fail. And this is a really important aspect of this. Because ultimately, what this will give you is you're not doing this again for salvation. You're doing this for the fullness of life in the gospel that Jesus has offered, and he's painted that picture for us. And we want to live in such a way that we live with that freedom from sin. We with that joy of life. We live with that love for people that would not only give us great excitement in the way we live, but it also draw people in, like the picture we see in Acts 2, where they were growing, the church was growing by the thousands daily, because these Christians look so radically different than the Romans of their day. And they were attracting in these people by sheer mercy, love, time, grace, all these things that would be added by doing this. So I want to encourage you in that to be that type of church. I know you can be and I know you will be here in Caledonia, here for your families. And I want to pray you in that task moving forward. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this freedom that you give us, that this is not on our shoulders, and if it were, we would mess it up, just like we saw those legends of the faith that you mentioned in Scripture right before it. But God, this is by the strength that comes from you through your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we thank you that on this side of the resurrection that we know there's no condemnation, and despite our failures, God, that there is joy knowing we will be with you for eternity as long as we're followers of you. God, I pray, Lord, that you would just encourage everybody in this room, not that they would feel downtrodden or burdened by the changes that need to be made, God, but encourage for what could be. And God, give them the wisdom and give them the strength to make that happen. Put the people in their relationships, and, or people in their lives, the relationships around them, to encourage them towards that, Lord, for the freedom that you offer in this life, fully human, in the way that Jesus was. 
God, I thank you again for them and their desire to be an impact on this community. I pray that you continue that work that you're already doing through them here, Lord. God, we thank you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.